Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for stopping by. Here I share different recipes and baking tips all the time, so you'll want to stay tuned for more. Um, and if that interests you, make sure to hit subscribe. I'd love to have you. So today we're gonna to be talking about 11 common baking mistakes that you might be making, as well as some ways to fix them. Because when it comes down to it, baking is just a science, really. There's so many skills and techniques that you have to learn, and it can oftentimes feel overwhelming. But with a few tips and tricks up your sleeve, you're going to be baking like a seasoned pastry chef in no time. So let's get into it. Number one is not measuring your ingredients correctly. And above everything else, I think this is the most important. And let me show you an example. For instance, let's say you're making a cake and it calls for a cup of flour, but you accidentally put in a cup and a third cup of flour. Your end result might be tough and chewy and just all around not pleasant. So for flour specifically, you want to make sure you're using the spoon and level method if you're using cups. And so what this means is you take your measuring cup and your bag of flour, and when you're spooning the flour in, you do it lightly into the cup. And then once you've hit the top, you level it off with an offset spatula or a knife. And by doing this, instead of packing the flour in, you're making sure that you get the right amount. And so it's really important to look at all of your different ingredients, know how to measure them properly, and if you do that, you're going to have delicious baked goods at all times, honestly. Up next is substituting ingredients. And as a recipe developer, this drives me crazy because when recipe creators or cookbook authors or chefs, when any of them make recipes, they're doing it with the specific ingredients in the recipe. And they're testing those recipes several, several times with those ingredients. But I know we've all been there. It's Saturday night and the craving for chocolate chip cookies hits you hard. And so you scramble in your cabinets to find all the ingredients and realize you don't have eggs. So you Google a replacement for egg and you start frantically making a flax egg, but the cookies turn out really crappy. And that's why substituting always can cause issues. You never know what's gonna happen if you start switching up the ingredients. So all that being said, try and follow the recipe as much as you can if uh, the time allows it. And if not, if you don't have the ingredients, try and search for an alternate recipe that aligns with what you have. You're gonna be happier in the end. Chances are when you've been baking, you've seen these instructions in the recipe. Mix until just combined, make sure not to overmix the batter, and those phrases all have a meaning. To get a little bit sciencey here, what's happening is when you're mixing a baking mixture, when you have your flour and your dry ingredients and you combine them with the liquid, you're starting to develop the gluten structure of the baked, uh, the baked good before it goes in the oven. And the more that you mix, the stronger that gluten structure will be, which can oftentimes lead to a tougher and chewier end result. So if a recipe tells you not to overmix, you want to make sure that you mix only until the flour or the dry ingredients are no longer present and you can't see them. And in case you're interested, I'll link an article down below from Food52 where they go over all the different types of baked goods, cookies, cakes, muffins, everything, and tell you when overmixing is overmixing. It's a really awesome article and I think it'll help you out. Number four then is not scraping the bowl. And this is a trick that I learned when I was in pastry school that I honestly, whenever I forget to do it, I am so mad at myself. And what this means is whenever you add a new ingredient into your bowl or your baking mixture, you want to take a rubber spatula and scrape the entire bowl very well to make sure that you're evenly incorporating all of your ingredients. And this is especially important uh, when adding things like liquids or dry ingredients because those can leave pockets in the dough that you might not realize are there, but when you bake it and it finishes, you could have a whole pocket of flour or just too much butter in one place and it just it never turns out well. And when it comes to scraping, I always like using silicon spatulas, and I'll have my favorite linked down below in the description box. I just find that they're really pliable and bendy, and they can really get into all the crevices of the bowl. If you're curious in learning how important it actually is to scrape the bowl, King Arthur Flower did an awesome study to show the uh, differences in results when you're scraping versus not, so I'll have that link below as well. It's a really interesting case study. Up next is chilling the dough. And <laughs> when I've made recipes, I know this drives me crazy as well. You are really excited to have um, delicious cookies come out of the oven, but they tell you to chill the dough in the fridge for 30 minutes before baking. And oftentimes you'll skip that step. But chilling is actually important because it helps in a number of different ways. 
For cookies specifically, chilling the dough can help keep them from spreading too much in the oven. It can help the gluten relax, which makes them lighter and more tender. And chilling the dough can also help concentrate the flavor, which leads to more delicious cookies in the end. So in terms of making sure that you always chill your dough, here are some tips you can do. You wanna make sure you read your recipe ahead of time and give yourself enough time to chill. Or what you can do is you can even make your cookie dough or any other dough the night before or a few days in advance. And then that way you can have cookies whenever you want them. That's honestly my favorite way to do it. Is there anything worse than freshly baked cookies coming out of the oven and then they're stuck to your pan? Honestly, my worst nightmare. So you're hearing it from me, folks. Make sure to grease your pans. And there's a couple different ways that you can do this. You could use a nonstick cooking spray like Pam. You can use parchment paper or aluminum foil, or you can use a silicon baking mat, which I love to use because they're reusable and better for the environment. I'll link a few of my favorite options down below. I actually have pre-cut parchment sheets in my kitchen and they're perfectly cut to be the exact size of my baking sheets, which saves so much hassle. I'll link those as well as my favorite silicon baking shot, baking mat, baking sheet, <laughs> silicon baking mat down below uh, if you wanted to pick one up for yourself. Okay, this one is definitely something that I've been guilty of and this is baking at the wrong temperature. And this can apply to a few different things. When you hit preheat on your oven and the number starts to go up, uh, you want to make sure to not put whatever you're baking into the oven until you reach that desired temperature. Because if you put it in earlier, the cookies or cake or muffins, whatever, is going to be baking at an incorrect temperature and it's going to affect the overall baking time length. So in that case, the recipe, what they're telling you, might not apply to your situation. So you want to make sure to always wait until the oven is entirely preheated and this also can apply to the oven temperature itself. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of ovens, if you're in an apartment or a house, they might not be the actual temperature that the oven is telling you. So I recommend investing in an oven thermometer, and I'll have a link below, and just pop that in your oven, turn it up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever you wanna try, and see how much they match up. You might be surprised at how different they are. So honestly, get to know your oven, see how it bakes, and then use all that knowledge to help improve your baking process over time. And while we're on the topic of ovens, you want to make sure not to open up your oven too early. So keep that door closed. This applies more so to certain types of baked goods than others. For instance, cakes that get their rise from aeration, like Genoese sponges. Um, those are the different types of cakes where you're using actually aeration, like whipping eggs to make them rise, instead of using chemical leaveners like baking soda or baking powder. And when you're baking a Genoese sponge, for instance, if it takes 25 minutes, if you open the oven door at 10 or 15 minutes just to see how it's doing, the cake will actually collapse in on itself and lose that rise. So especially with cakes, I recommend keeping the oven door closed and maybe just put the oven light on to see how it's doing. As much as we all wish we had a spidey sense to know when baked goods are done, that's oftentimes not the case. Well, unless you're Peter from the Great British Bake Off who can listen to his cakes to know when they're done. Oh, Peter. Did anybody else love him on the last season of Bake Off? I thought he was just the cutest person ever and I really wish I could meet him one day. So each type of baked good has a different parameter for testing for doneness, and in order to become a better baker, you want to learn exactly what to look for for each different baked good. And this is something that the more you bake over time, the more you're going to learn and know what to look for. Um, but it's definitely something you can do some research on as well. I actually have a whole article about how to test if a cake is done that has three different ways that you can do, um, and I will leave that linked below in case you want to learn more. All right, we're getting to the end here. Number 10 is not letting your cake or cupcakes cool completely before frosting. So when you take your cupcakes or cake out of the oven, you wanna make sure to let it cool completely at room temperature before slathering all that delicious frosting on top. Because if you add the frosting when it's still hot, it's going to pull the crumbs up and then the crumbs will be integrated with the frosting and it's just not lovely. And it's also going to make the frosting melt. So those are just two situations you don't wanna be in. So let the cakes cool completely at room temperature, and you can even throw them in the fridge for a little while to really chill up, or you can make them a couple days ahead of time and then save yourself the hassle of doing everything at once. You can make the cakes or cupcakes over a couple different days. Last but not least, the last baking mistake I see all the time is not freezing your leftovers. 
And especially nowadays when we're not sharing as many baked goods with friends and family, you want to make sure that you're prolonging the life of your baked goods. Because if you bake a batch of 12 cupcakes, chances are you're not going to be able to eat all 12 in a couple days. And so that's where freezing comes in. You'd be surprised at how many baked goods you can freeze. And uh, there's different techniques and tips and ways you can do this. And I actually made a whole article about this detailing each type of baked good, how to freeze it. So I'll have that linked below in case you want to learn more. But just to give you a few examples, cookies, you can actually freeze the cookie dough balls into a container and then just let them thaw uh, in the fridge or at room temperature to bake. You can also freeze cookies once they're baked. Or for instance, you could do cakes. You could freeze the cake layers individually after they're baked, let them thaw and then frost them. There's just so many different ways that you might not realize and you want to make sure you're freezing as long as you have the, uh, the freezer space to do so. Alright, so those are my 11 common baking mistakes that I've personally made in the past and that I see a lot of people making. And I hope you found them useful and that you'll be able to implement a few of these tips and tricks into your own kitchen to improve your baking. But I'd love to know in the comments what are some baking mistakes that you've made in the past. Let me know and let's start the conversation there. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure to hit the like button down below and subscribe to my channel. It just really helps others find the videos and grow, and I'd appreciate to have you here. And if you want to follow along for more behind the scenes content, um, more personal life stuff, just to see what's going on when I'm not here on YouTube, you can check me out on Instagram, and it's just the Baker's Almanac. But that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed the video, uh, and happy baking everyone! I'll see you next time.